Income tax 2023-2024. Maker's depreciation. How is the depreciation deduction figured? Part number two. Get ready and some coffee because tax preparation is like a choose your own adventure novel. Every choice leading to more pages of paperwork. Most first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff, anyways. Like our trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because. Apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. So this information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus deductions resulting in taxable income. Sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. The schedule C itself, however, basically being an income statement, business income minus business expenses, which you can call business deductions resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls from the schedule C into line one income of the formula. The formula outlining the calculation on form 1040, this being the first page of the form 1040, schedule C ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one. This is the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income Part 1, Schedule C rolling into Line 3, Business Income or Loss. This is the Schedule C, Profit or Loss from Business, having an income statement format, income minus expenses. We are on the expenses side, usually having the most categories within it, some expenses being more complex than others, such as depreciation, which we saw in prior presentations, even if we have a cash method, we're forced to do some accrual things by the tax code, such as not expensing something like property planting equipment, but putting it on the books as an asset, which is difficult to do given the income statement format of the Schedule C, therefore needing depreciation schedules, recording the balance sheet, asset account of property plant and equipment, and related contra asset account, which is accumulated depreciation and calculating the current year expense depreciation expense. Noting maker's depreciation, which is what we're focused on that now, follows to a large degree because the tax code took from generally accepted accounting principles or accrual accounting generally concepts and then tacked on to it some other things, such as the 179 deduction and the special depreciation, which we talked about in prior presentations. So we would think the heart that we're looking at right now, maker's depreciation will be the longest lasting, whereas the changes will often happen on the 179 and the special depreciations because those are the things that don't tie specifically into accounting concepts. In the prior presentation, we discussed how we can use tables to help calculate depreciation expense in the year of purchase, as well as the years of the useful life of the property, plant, and equipment. Now we're going to be discussing a sale or other disposition before the recovery period ends. So in other words, let's imagine we buy a $10,000 piece of equipment. We would like to expense it at the point of purchase, but the IRS will typically not let us expense it, just calling it like equipment expense, but rather put it on the books as an asset and then get the benefit of that asset over the useful life. We might be able to get a 179 and a special depreciation up front, but right now we're focusing in on the maker's depreciation, which is oftentimes like a double declining method that has like a half year convention, for example. 
Tables can often help us with those calculations, as can, of course, software help us with those calculations. And if we map out and say it's a five-year piece of property, we can determine how much depreciation we get in year one uh, through the five years of the life of the property. Of course, there will be a kink in that logic or that rationale if we sell or dispose of the property, especially before it has been fully depreciated, before the five years have ended, before we've gotten a benefit from the cost in the form of an expense of depreciation expense over the useful life of the property. So that means when we sell something, we're going to have to take it off the books. This is one of the more problems or one of the complexities within a cruel system, which is one of the reasons we often like to default to a cash based system, because on the accrual system, now I have these things that I have to track as assets, as opposed to just expensing them when I purchased them. So that means that when I sell something, I have to actually identify the thing that I physically sold in my business to my depreciation schedules so that I, I can figure out what my gain or loss is going to be. So this is why it becomes very important for us to keep accurate records as we record the purchases that we make, which is not intuitive oftentimes to people because if you have very vague records, you can still put the thing on the books and depreciate it in the year of purchase, but you will run into problems when you dispose or sell things because you won't be able to identify the thing that you're selling on the depreciation schedules and that's going to cause all kinds of problems so as we as we discuss this remember that when you put things on the books for depreciation you want to be able to give identification numbers if possible you want to break out the thing you're putting on the books to specific items. In other words, if I bought 10 computers, I don't want to put it on the depreciation schedule as 10 computers, but rather as one 10 individual computers would be better because then when I sell the computers, I might sell just one of them out of the 10 of them. And I need to take one item off the books rather than taking one tenth of one item off the books, right? That's going to be easier. So just something to keep in mind as we put these items on the books. Now, when we take them off the books, we're going to have to figure out what the adjusted basis will be. In other words, how much of that potential energy, potential deduction, in our case, the 10,000, have we already taken and gotten a benefit on? And how much can we still consume at the point of sale, which will result in a lower gain, the bigger the basis, the lower the gain, which is good for taxes. We want less gain for taxes or the larger of a loss. And again, losses are good for taxes in essence. Okay. So if you sell or otherwise dispose of your property before the end of the recovery period, your depreciation deduction for the year of disposition will be only part of the depreci uh, depreciation amount for the full year. So in other words, if I'm trying to sell something at the year that I sell it and it's not fully depreciated, well, I still owned it for part of the year. So I'm going to have to figure out some depreciation for part of the year up to the point that I sold. And then I'm going to figure out the adjusted basis of the thing that I sold so I can figure out whether I had a gain or loss on the sale. So you have disposed of your property if you have permanently withdrawn it from use in your business or income producing activity because of its sale, exchange, retirement, abandonment, involuntary conversion, or destruction. So in other words, obviously, if we sell the property, we know that we sold it. We know that there's a, a transaction that takes place. Sometimes disposing of property is, is a little bit more difficult to deal with because no cash from a bookkeeping standpoint has hit our books, triggering us to record a transaction. But if the thing is no longer on the books because we disposed of it, we need to basically take it off the books. And if it does, if it's not fully depreciated, then we're going to have consequences for the depreciation in basically the year of disposal. We can think of a disposal like a sale when we put it into our accounting or like our software, because it's basically as though you sold it for nothing, right? You can calculate it kind of like the same way as though you sold something for nothing. If it still had potential deduction on the books, you would think you would have a loss based on the potential deduction, the amount that you have not fully depreciated yet. If it was fully depreciated, you would think it's not going to have an impact on your tax calculations because you're going to take off the cost and the related accumulated depreciation. 
but you still want to take it off the books. Otherwise, your depreciation schedules are going to be showing all these items that you don't actually physically have, and it's going to get messy and ugly. So after you figure the full year depreciation amount, figure the deductible part using the convention that applies to the property. All right, half year convention used. So for property for which you use a half year convention, the depreciation deduction for the year of this disposition is half the depreciation determined for the full year. Okay, so remember when we put the depreciate, depreciable property on the books, usually we have a half year convention for most types of property for small businesses like three, five, seven year. We assume no matter when we purchased it that we bought it like in the middle of the year, which is the half year convention making the first year calculation easier. When we have the last year, then we're also gonna have a, ha a half year for the last year of depreciation that we have. So, so then you would think you would have a similar convention if we like disposed or sold the property. We, we might use this simple calculation of assuming that we sold the property like in the middle of the year, which will once again help us to calculate that last year of depreciation a little bit more easily. Mid-quarter convention used. So for property for which you use the mid-quarter convention, figure your depreciation deduction for the year of the disposition by multiplying a full year of depreciation by the percentage listed below for the quarter in which you disposed of the property. So first quarter, 12.5, second quarter, 37.5, third quarter, 62.5, and fourth, 87.5. Similar concept here. If I used a mid-quarter convention, on the depreciation calculation when I bought it, and that would happen, you will recall, if I bought a lot of the three, five, and seven year property, which is usually a half year convention in the last quarter of the year, the IRS forcing me to go from a half year or mid year to mid quarter, that means that when I sell it, I'm gonna have to do a sim, I can kind of make a similar kind of assumption that I sold it on a mid quarter convention and use these percentage for the part of the year. Let's look at an example. On December 2nd, 2020, you placed in service an item of five-year property costing $10,000. You did not claim the 179 deduction and the property does not qualify for special depreciation allowance. We'll just eliminate those items for now because we're focusing on makers. Your unadjusted basis for the property was $10,000. You used the mid-quarter convention because this was the only item of business property you placed in service in 2020 and it was placed in service during the last three months of your tax year. In other words, it would have been half-year convention, but you purchased it in the last quarter and the IRS, because you had most of your purchases in the last quarter, because that's the only thing you purchased, made you use the mid-quarter convention. So your property is in the five-year property class, so you used table A5 to figure your depreciation deduction. Your depreciations for 2020, 2021, and 2022 were 500, which they pulled this from the table, 10,000 times 0 0.05, 3,800, 38% times the 10,000 and then 2,280, which is the 22.8 uh, times the 10,000 respectively. You disposed of the property on April 6, 2023 to determine your depreciation deduction for 2023. First figure the deduction for the full year. So now you're going to say, okay, I disposed of it in the year, but I held on to it for part of the year. So I'm going to have some depreciation for that year of deduction. Again, software quite helpful to help you with these calculations, but you want to kind of understand it conceptually at the least. So this is a 1,368. So that's going to be just pulling this from the tables using the maker's depreciation as though we did not dispose of it that year. April is the second quarter of the year. So you multiply 1,368 by the 37.5 in the prior table to get your depreciation deduction for the current year, 513. So, so that means you're going to get this deduction of the 513 in the current year. And then, of course, when you dispose of it, you could have a gain or loss because you'll have to take the sales price minus the adjusted basis. And, and the adjusted basis now, you can see that we had in year one, if I calculate this correctly, 500. And then in year two, 3800. And then in year three, 2280. And then in the year of disposal, we dispose, we calculate another 513. 
So that's how much we deducted over the life, which you can call accumulated depreciation up until this point, minus the 10,000. So that means that we had an adjusted basis of 2,907. So if I calculated that correctly, if you sold it then for something uh, over 2,907, you would have a gain, right? Uh, if you disposed of it or sold it for something less, then you might have a loss. So you could see you want this basis the higher the basis at the point of sale, the better for taxes because it will result in a lower gain or a greater loss. Okay, mid-month conversion used. But of course, you don't want to, you would rather get the deduction up front if you could. Like if I just deducted 10,000 up front, I would rather do that and have my basis at zero because now I consumed it all in the, in the beginning. And then when I sold it, whatever I sell it for would basically be a gain possibly subject to recapture rules and stuff, but we'll talk about that later. So mid-month convention. So if you dispose of residential re uh, rental or non-residential real property, figure your depreciation deduction for the year of disposition by multiplying a full year of depreciation by a fraction. The numerator of the fraction is the number of months, including partial months in the year that the property is considered in service. The denominator is 12. So that's kind of what you would normally expect because that's going to be a partial year type of calculation, which we're rounding to like a mid-month calculation when we sold it. Uh, and, and that same kind of concept. Example, on July 2nd, 2021, you purchased and placed in service residential rental property. The property cost $100,000, not including the cost of land. You used table uh, A6. So we're taking land out of it because land is not depreciable, only the building part. You use table A6 to figure your maker's depreciation for this property. You sold the property on March 2nd, 2023. You file tax return based on the calendar year. A full year of depreciation for 2023 is 3,636. So, so you figured the full year first. And then this is 100,000 multiplied times 0 0.0363 from the table. The percentage for the seven month of uh, the third recovery year from table A6. Uh, you then applied the mid-month convention for the 21 over two, 21 12 months uh, uh, of use in 2023. I think this fraction might have gotten messed up when I pulled that over. So treat the month of disposition as uh, one half month of use. Multiply the 3636 three, by the fraction, so 2.5 uh, over 12. So there's the fraction we're looking for, uh, the 2.5 months uh, over 12, because it's a mid-month convention, to get your 2023 depreciation deduction of $757.50. Okay. Figuring the deduction without using the tables. Instead of using the rates and the percentage tables to figure your depreciation deduction, you can figure it yourself. Before making the computation uh, each year, you must reduce your adjusted basis in the property by the depreciation claimed, uh, claimed the previous years. Caution. So figuring maker's deductions without using the tables will generally result in a slightly different amount than using the tables. So in other words, when you calculate maker's depreciation in particular, uh, the, the table, it gets a little bit messy of a calculation because you're trying to accelerate more of the depreciation up front and then, and then uh, have less of it in the latter years. And it actually doesn't work out perfectly. It's not the most beautiful uh, kind of method but because you have to kind of switch back to the straight line method and so on at the last year. So if you calculate it manually, you might come up with something slightly different than the tables, which might make you think that you did something wrong, but you possibly didn't because the tables are, might smooth it out a little bit differently than if you calculated it manually. So declining balance method. When using a declining balance method, you apply the same depreciation rate each year to the adjusted basis of your property. So remember that when we're thinking about the table, using the tables, we apply the rate to the, to the unadjusted basis. But when we use, if you've ever taken accounting courses and calculated the adjusted basis, you have to take the, the double declining rate times the adjusted basis meaning like the book value after each year, 
Uh, so you must use the, the applicable convention for the first tax year and you must, meaning is it mid-month, mid-quarter, um, mid-year or half year, and you must switch to straight line method beginning the first year for which it will give an equal or greater deduction. In other words, when, when I'm using the, the double declining rate, there's going to be a point at which the straight line rate basically has a higher amount of deduction, and that's going to be the flip to, to make the thing work. Because again, the normal double declining rate doesn't actually depreciate perfectly down to zero. So the straight line method is, uh, is explained later. So you figure depreciation for the year you place property in service as follows. Multiply your adjusted basis in the property by the declining balance rate. Apply the applicable convention, which is half year or mid quarter, mid month, for example. You figure depreciation for all other years before the year you switch to the straight line method as follows. Uh, reduce your, ba your adjusted basis in the property by the depreciation allowed or allowable in earlier years, meaning you have to look at the book value or adjusted basis and then multiply this new adjusted basis by the same declining balance rate used in earlier years. So if you dispose of property before the end of its recovery period, see using the applicable convention later for information on how to figure depreciation for the year dispose of it. Figuring depreciation under the declining balance method and switching to the straight line method is illustrated in example one later under example. So we might take a look at that. Declining balance rate. So you figure the declining balance rate by dividing the specific declining balance percent, 150% or 200% uh, changed to a decimal by the number of years in the property's recovery period. So for example, for a three-year property, uh, depreciated, depreciated using 200% declining balance, divide two by three to, to get 0.6667 uh, or 66.67. So another way you might, you also might think about that. You might say, well, you might find like the straight line and then make it double, like double. So I can say, well, if it was three year property, I can take one over three. That would be the straight line rate, 0.333. And if I double it times two, that's how, that's another way that might intuitively kind of make sense to you to get to kind of like the double declining rate. So for 15 year property depreciation used the 150 declining balance rate, divide uh, 1.5 by 15 to get 0.1 or a 10% declining rate. So again, you might say, okay, 15, one divided by 15, that would be the straight line times 1.5 or 150%, 1.5, which would give you then the 10% uh, percent, right, rate. So you might think about that's how, however it makes sense to you, right? But the following table shows the declining balance rate uh, for each property class and the first year for which the straight line method gives you an equal or greater deduction. So property class, three-year property, double, this is the 200% double uh, declining basis, declining rate 66.67. So, uh, and then the year that it switches from double declining to straight line is in the third year. So five-year property, double declining, declining rate is going to be 40% because it's, again, if we calculate this out, why would that be? It's going to be, well, it's because it's five-year property, one over five, that would be the straight line rate times two, 40%. It switches to straight line in the fourth year, I believe is what this is saying over here. Seven-year property, one over seven, that would be the straight line rate times two, 28.57. It switches to straight line on the fifth year. And then we've got the 10-year property, 1 over 10. That would be the straight line rate, 1 over uh, 10 times 2, 20%, switches on the seventh year. And then the 15-year property, as we saw, 1 over 15 would be the straight line times 1.5, 150%. It's going to be the 10% the if I move the decimal two places over and so on. All right. So straight line method. So when using the straight line method, you apply a different depreciation rate each year to the adjusted basis of uh, your property. You must use the applicable convention 
uh, in the year you place the property in service and the year you dispose of the property. So you figure depreciation for the year you place the property in service as follows. Multiply your adjusted basis in the property by the straight line rate. So apply the uh, applicable convention. You figure depreciation for all other years, including the year uh, you, you switch from the declining balance method to straight line method as follows. Reduce your adjusted basis in the property by the depreciation allowed or allowable in earlier years under any method. Determine the depreciation rate for the year and multiply the adjusted basis figured in one by the depreciation rate figured in two. Straight line rate. You determine the straight line depreciation rate for any tax year by dividing the number one by the years remaining in the recovery period at the beginning of the year. So the straight line rate is, is easy to calculate. You can say, uh, it, it, sometimes it's easier to think like if I bought a 10,000 piece of equipment, like say it was a $10,000 piece of equipment, and I was going to depreciate it over a useful life of 10 years, you would take the 10,000 divided by 10, right? And it would be 1,000 a year. That's often what we do like naturally. So you might be asking, well, what, is, what does the straight line rate mean? Well, if I convert that to a rate, I would take that 10% divided by uh, divide, divided by 1,000 divided by the 10,000, right? And that gives me a 10%. So in other words, if I'm going to be able to deduct 10,000 each year, the rate, at least in year one, is going to be 0 0.1, 10% times 10,000, which is the 1,000, which was the 10,000 divided by 10 years, right? That's going to be... That's going to be uh, uh, the rate. Now you can get there faster by just saying, well, I'm just going to take one over 10 years, one over 10, that'll give you the straight line rate. Okay. So then when figuring the number of years remaining, you must take into account the, con the convention used in the year you placed the property in service. If the number of years remaining is less than one, the depreciation rate uh, for that tax year is one or a hundred percent using the applicable convention. Conventions, you will recall, is like the half year versus mid-month convention versus mid-year. The applicable convention discussed earlier under which convention applies affects how you figure your depreciation deduction for the year you place your property in service and for the year you dispose of it. It determines how much of the recovery period remains at the beginning of each year, so it allow also affects the depreciation rate for property you depreciate under the straight line method. See straight line rate in the previous discussion. Use the applicable conversion as explained in the following discussion. So half year convention. So if uh, this conversion applies, you deduct a half year of depreciation for the first year and last year that you depreciate the property. You can see why they like the half year uh, convention as a default convention because that makes it nice and easy of just taking half the year. Any other percent of the year is gonna cause more complications, right? So, so you deduct a full year of depreciation for any other year during the recovery period. Figure your depreciation deduction for the year you place the property in service by dividing the depreciation for a full year by two. So obviously, if we're looking at the half year convention, I can just calculate the full years of depreciation which in our example was 10,000 times 0.1. And if it's half year convention, I divide it by two, I have it, and we get the 500 in that case. So that would be in the first and last year would be the half years. So if you dispose of the property before the end of the recovery period, figure your depreciation deduction for the year of the disposition the same way. In other words, if I dispose of it, I have to calculate the depreciation for a partial year, which I'm gonna use a half year convention to do. So if you held the property for the entire recovery period, your depreciation deduction for the year that includes the final six months of the recovery period is the amount of your unrecovered basis in the property. Mid-quarter convention. So if this convention applies, the depreciation you can deduct for the first year you depreciate the property depends on the quarter in which you place the property in service. This is similar to what we saw before in that 
if I purchased the property and I couldn't get a half year convention because I purchased it at the end of the year, the IRS makes me use a mid quarter convention, which will affect the point that I purchase it as well as disposition of the property at the back end. A quarter uh, of a full 12 month tax year is a period of three months. So because we have 12 divided by four is three months in quarters. So the first quarter uh, in a year begins on the first day of the tax year. The second quarter begins on the first day of the fourth month of the tax year. The third quarter begins on the first day of the seventh month of the tax year. The fourth quarter begins on the first day of the 10th month of the tax year. So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, right? So a calendar year is divided into the following quarters. First, January, February, March. Second, April, May, June. Third, July, August, September. Fourth, October, November, December. Each of them having three months because 12 divided by four is three. Figure your depreciation deduction for the year you place the property in service by multiplying the depreciation for a full year by the percentage listed below for the quarter you place the property in service. So first quarter, 87.5, second quarter, 62.5, and so on and so forth. If uh, you dispose of the property before the end of the recovery period, figure your depreciation deduction for the year of disposition by multiplying a full year of depreciation by the percentage listed below for the quarter you dispose of the property. So here we have our worksheet first, second, third, and fourth. If you hold the property for the entire recovery period, your depreciation deduction for the year uh, that includes the final quarter of the recovery period is the amount of your unrecovered basis in the property. Then we of course have the mid-month convention, similar to what we saw before, so I'll go through it a little bit more quickly. If this conversion applies, the depreciation you can deduct for the first year that you depreciate the property depends on the month in which you place the property in service, often with real estate here on the mid-month convention. Figure your depreciation deduction for the year you place the property in service by multiplying the depreciation for a full year by a fraction. The numerator of the fraction is the number of full months in the year that the property is in service plus one half or 0.5. Uh, the denominator is 12. That would make sense because 12 months in the year. And so if, and it's a mid month, so you've got the plus, you know, the, mid, the middle of the month. So if you dispose of the property before the end of the recovery period, figure your depreciation deduction for the year of the disposition the same way. If you hold the property for the entire recovery period, your depreciation deduction for the year that includes the final month of the recovery period is the amount of your unrecovered basis in the property.